£2 million to send just one asylum seeker from the UK to Rwanda. 182,000 per person on top of that, in comparison, to, pro to process an asylum seeker in the UK, in comparison, it costs just £21,000. And I rise today to speak in favour of all ten of the Lord's amendments that are before us today. They each serve to make this shambolic mess of a bill marginally less absurd. And, as I will come to in a second, they would serve only to put in statute what ministers have actually promised from that dispatch box. Not one of these amendments is designed to prevent the departure of flights to Rwanda, as the Prime Minister has repeatedly and wrongly implied that they will. Mr Speaker, we all want to end the Tory small boat chaos. And I am proud that the Labour Party has consistently put forward a smart, pragmatic and sensible plan to do so. Starting by going after the criminal smuggler gangs at source through a new cross-border police unit and a new security partnership with Europol. But this bill and the treaty which accompanies it will not contribute in any way to achieving that aim. Because I will give way. This is the government. I'm very grateful for him giving way on that uh, point. Uh, since uh, 2020, we've seen 82 gangs disrupted and over 400 people mm. arrested because of the actions of this government. Mm. I'm keen to understand, with Labour's idea of smash the gangs, how many more they expect that to be, how much more that will cost, and what does that look like in a total percentage of numbers? We will eradicate the activity of the criminal smuggler gangs by having a proper security partnership with our European partners and allies. I'd remind the Honourable Gentleman that his party has spent the last eight years trashing and destroying our relationships with our European partners and allies. So what we would have with a Labour government is a basis of trust to get the results that we need to see for the British people. That is what sovereignty is all about, Mr Speaker. Because the entire Rwanda debacle has absorbed a vast amount of time, energy and money that should instead have been focused on taking back control of our border security from the criminal gangs who are trading in human misery. And let's not forget that more than 100,000 asylum seekers have crossed in small boats uh, since then, with 40,000 on this Prime Minister's watch alone. This chaos must end. And this government is clearly unable to restore order at the border. So it's clearly time for them to get out of the way so Labour can get the job done. Yeah. Mr Speaker, before I get into the substance of the amendments, I'd like to pay tribute to the noble members of the other place who tabled them. Yeah. In so doing, they were fulfilling their constitutional, democratic and patriotic duty by scrutinising and seeking to amend this bill just as they would any other piece of legislation that comes before them. They have not been intimidated or sidetracked by the Prime Minister's mistaken assertion that this legislation would ha should have some kind of special status or treatment, which should somehow allow ministers to railroad it through Parliament and drive and coach and horses through Britain's long-standing democratic conventions. Indeed, this profoundly dismissive attitude has manifested itself in the way in which that the government has point-blank refused to engage with these Lords Amendments, rejecting every one of them, rather than seeking to use them and see them as a basis for negotiation and compromise. I will give way. I'm most, great, I'm most grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. Um, is he aware of the fact that the Constitutional Committee of the House of Lords, uh, which does in fact include a significant number of the uh, members of the House of Lords to which he's just referred, actually quite explicitly stated in relation, and I'm speaking here about Amendment 1, Clause 1, that where it is clear and unambiguous in the words used in a statute that international law gives way to the supremacy and sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament, they said it in paragraph 58 of their report only last year. Well, what I would remind the uh, Honourable Gentleman of is that the Supreme Court, the highest court of our land, has ruled unanimously and in no uncertain terms that Rwanda is not a safe country to which to send asylum seekers. And I, and I recognise, I know he's very uh, taken with parliamentary sovereignty, and that's very important. <laughs> parliamentary sovereignty must be based on paying due regard to the findings of our judiciary. And uh, it, is, it is to be exercised with caution and moderation, yeah. Mr Speaker. And that is why it's so important that, that, that our colleagues in the other place have played this role. 
I will give way one more time. I'm extreme, I am extremely grateful because this is right at the heart of this matter. In the Rwanda judgment itself, in paragraph 144, it is unequivocal that the Lord President of the, of the Supreme Court ruled the dismissal of one of the cases, ASM, an Iraqi, on very specific grounds, and he said that because of the sovereignty of Parliament with respect to the legislation under the Immigration Act and the Retained EU Law Act, the consequence was that they had to dismiss, dismiss his claim precisely because in that judgment the supremacy of Parliament prevailed for the very reason I've just given, and that is at paragraph 144 under the principle of legality. Well, I thank him for his intervention, but the, the, at the end of the day, you cannot legislate to, make, to turn dogs into cats. You cannot legislate for the sky to be green and the grass to be blue. And it is a basic tenet of the respect with which our institutions should be treated that to put this kind of absurd legislation before us is frankly turning our institutions into a laughing stock. So I, I would uh, respectfully suggest that uh, the Honourable Gentleman keeps that in mind. Now let's be clear, uh, Mr Speaker, the only special or unique status uh, in terms of the aspects of this Bill and the treaty that accompany it that can be found are in its extortionate implementation costs, its unlawful nature and its glaring unworkability. Indeed, as I move into the details of these amendments, I feel it's important to point out that since the Rwanda Bill was last debated in this place, even more evidence of the astonishing unaffordability of the scheme has come to light. This failing scheme was already costing the British taxpayer almost £400 million, even though not a single asylum seeker has been sent to Rwanda. But every new detail is more astounding than the last. And we recently learned that the first 300 asylum seekers to be sent to Rwanda would cost the British taxpayer an extra £200 million on top of that, earning an invoice worth £570 million from the Rwandan government for just 1% of the 30,000 asylum seekers who crossed the small boats last year. That's almost £2 million per asylum seeker. Just let that sink in for a moment. £2 million to send just one asylum seeker from the UK to Rwanda. And then another 100, I will in one second, and then another 182,000 per person on top of that, in comparison, to, pro to process an asylum seeker in the UK, in comparison, it costs just £21,000. I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. He will be aware of the thousands of asylum seekers that are being dispersed up and down the country with very little service, support to local services. So while the government is obsessing with gimmicks that are not dealing with the real problems in communities and supporting local communities to host that they are dispersing up and down the country, this crisis continues and they need to get a grip on it. I thank uh, my honourable friend. She's absolutely right that the um, uh, the smoke and mirrors that's been used about clearing the backlog, lots of administrative withdrawals, lots of other ways of just getting people out of the backlog, is being combined with ex shortening the eviction period, which is leading to a staggering increase in homelessness amongst those who've been granted asylum. It is frankly a stain on the conscience of our country what's happening with that, a total lack of coordination between the Home Office, DLUC and our colleagues in local authorities, and it is leaving our local authorities high and dry. I, will give I thank him for giving way. Whilst I might not share many of the views which he is expressing in this bill, does he not share my surprise that the government has refused to accept Amendment 8, which would have required it to report on the success of this bill, where the number of remo removals would be reported to Parliament, yet the government does not want that? Does he suspect that? Like I, that maybe the government knows that this bill is not going to be as effective as what yeah. they think it's going to be. Well, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman. That that's an excellent question, and and who knows? Perhaps sometimes the mask slips in terms of the government's response to some of these amendments. The reason they've decided to very disrespectfully refuse to engage on any of them is perhaps because, exactly as he says, they are very worried about what might happen if they do. When you lift the lid on the box, you see that it's a total failure inside it. On that point, I, I, I do thank the Shadow Minister because he is making an excellent speech. But let us not forget history. 
The Tories Rwanda bill is the third new law on channel crossings in just three years. Mr Deputy Speaker, the first law uh, has only been partly suspended because it had so many problems and it was actually making things worse. The second bill has still not been fully enacted and this is a third bill, another gimmick at £2 million per person cost to the public purse. And does my uh, honourable friend agree that rather than constantly chasing gimmicks and trying to dupe the British public, that the government finally needs to get a grip on the situation and stop pursuing these gimmicks. Well, I thank my honourable friend uh, for that intervention, and I agree with every word uh, of what he said. Just imagine if the amount of time and money and resource and energy and political capital that has been burned on this harebrained Rwanda scheme had been used on doing things that might actually deliver. And just imagine if they'd listened to Labour's plan for delivering the change that we need to see. We might have actually got some progress and seen things working. And by the way, we've supported what the government's done on Albania. Why don't we see more of that rather than this utterly ridiculous government by gimmick? What a waste of time and money. Now, the level of waste and this government's cavalier attitude to taxpayers' money are utterly staggering. And where, oh, where is the plan for the other 99% that they say uh, are going to be inadmissible? Tens of thousands of people who are now ineligible to be processed, ineligible to claim in our asylum system, but they can't be sent to Rwanda either. That particular backlog, the so-called PERMA backlog, currently stands at 56,000 people, with most of them living in more than 300 taxpayer-funded hotels across the country, costing millions of pounds every single day. Which is why... I will... I thank you, Honourable Member, for giving You make a very powerful argument about the wasteful uh, nature of this government's policy. Is, is my friend aware that the two million cost per person of sending someone to Rwanda would cover 67 new police officers in my constituency or 72 new nurses to fix the horrendous backlog created by this shambolic government? Yeah. Well, I thank my honourable friend for, for giving way. He's absolutely done his maths on the two million pounds. I uh, did particularly enjoy. Uh, the uh, analogy with the Virgin Galactic uh, space and, uh, craft, and, and that really does show that the Rwanda plan is a galactically wasteful <laughs> policy. Uh, but he's, he's quite right um, on the fact that so much of this is about choices and priorities, and uh, the choices and priorities that the government, government has shown are simply the wrong ones in terms of wasting uh, very valuable taxpayers' money that could be so better focused elsewhere. And that is why we support Lord's Amendment 8, Mr Speaker, which is a Labour frontbench amendment in the name of the noble Lord Coker. This amendment requires the Government to report on the timetable for removing inadmissible asylum seekers under the Illegal Migration Act. We absolutely need to see accountability over the inadmissibility provisions that have created that perma backlog of 55,000 small boat asylum seekers stuck in limbo, unable to be processed. So perhaps the Minister could tell us now, if 99% of the people crossing in small boats are not likely to be sent to Rwanda, then what will happen to them? Will the Minister just now admit that in spite of all his bluff and bluster, they will simply be let into our asylum system yep. after all? I don't know if he wants to. No. The whole premise of inadmissibility was always a one-way street to limbo and shambles. As uh, the Shadow Home Secretary and I have warned the Ministers in this chamber continuously over the past two years. There is, of course, an alternative. I hope members opposite have been listening, because for the last 18 months at this dispatch box, myself and my right friend, the Shadow Home Secretary, have been absolutely clear on how Labour will prevent the dangerous and life-threatening channel crossings and how we will also fix our broken asylum system. I've already mentioned how we would redirect the money set aside for the Rwandan government into a cross-border police unit and intelligence-sharing security partnership with Europol in order to smash the criminal smuggler gangs upstream. But as part of our plan, we would also ensure people who have no right to be here are removed to a safe third country. Since 2010, under the Tories, removals have collapsed. The returns of foreign national offenders have fallen by 27%, and the returns of failed asylum seekers have fallen by 44%. 
Under Labour's plan, a new returns and enforcement unit would include 1,000 additional officials to expedite removals, with £35 million set aside to create new Nightingale courts to fast-track appeals and to pursue tougher action on employers who employ migrants illegally. I thank the Shadow Minister for giving way. He says he wants removals to a safe third country. Which one? I, 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 thank, I thank the Honourable uh, Sorry, I'm very sorry. Would the Honourable Member just mind repeating that? I was just. Oh, thank you. Well, it's always good to listen to an intervention, but I'll repeat it for him. Um, he said he would, one of these parts of his plan would be to remove people to a safe third country. Simple question. If not, if not Rwanda, which one? I, I apologise. It should have said home country. I should have said home country. I, I misspoke, and I'd like to correct the record. I'm sorry, it was home country. Uh, uh, apologies, I. I, was, um, I, was, I misspoke there. Labour's common sense pragmatic plan will smash the business model of the criminal gangs, deter dangerous journeys and tackle the backlog. 